Today, uh, the sermon scripture comes from Matthew 21, verses 33 to 46, and Jesus is once again telling us a parable. Uh, he's talking to the religious leaders who are plotting his death, and he's revealing to them that their plans will inevitably and ironically lead to the fulfillment of scripture. And so listen now to the parable of the wicked tenants. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard with a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce of the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this, his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them, and they wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, we, in the, in the season of the church, we celebrate uh, Pentecost, we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit. God gave us the Holy Spirit so that we might have a guide, one who would lead us through life. God didn't give the Spirit to us just for a day. He gave it for the life of the believers. And God's Spirit is that gift in turn who gives believers additional gifts so that we can act in our world. Now, God's Spirit is a, is a sort of so, source of strength for us so that we can draw upon Him, lean upon the Holy Spirit, and be led by the Holy Spirit as we seek to press on in, in, through our daily walk, our daily spiritual walk, much like the Israelites did after their exodus from Egypt. Now, after being set free from the, the slave, slavery to the Egyptians, the Israelites, who had not governed themselves in many, many, many years, needed to establish a society. They needed to establish a way of being a people together. So God provided them with the rules that we heard her read earlier to govern Israel. We commonly refer to them as the Ten Commandments. And so these laws were based on, on the people of God, remembering and not forgetting God. It was about them learning to, to live in, in praise of God and worship of God and to live together to treat each other well. And so, uh, this remembrance of God was a tangible exercise for both the people individually and as a community together to help them to live in light of God's revealed character, especially when they were faced with obstacles or hindrances to their faith. And so the Ten Commandments, they were good for the individual, they were good for society. And the 16th century teaching document called the Heidelberg Catechism, it shows in the following that the Ten Commandments, through those Ten Commandments, we learn how to love God, and we learn how to love one another. That's what all of these little rules are about, about loving God and how we are to treat God and about how we are to treat each other and how to love each other. And so um, when we think about that, what we, we need to think about why it is that God wants us to remember these things. Now, there's a film that came out not that long, it's called Yesterday. And in that, in that film, there's an event that occurs that changes history. Okay, it changes history. Now, in that change, uh, in the event that happens, it, it so happens that everybody else in the world, except for three people, have forgotten totally about the Beatles. 
Okay? They've totally forgotten about who the Beatles are, about the Beatles' music. They don't know who they are except for those three people. And so these three people try to keep that music alive, try to do their best to show everybody what it's like and what they're missing in not remembering the Beatles. But eventually everyone forgets the Beatles. Now think about it. What would it be like in our world if we all forgot about God? who God is and what God has done. Think about what kind of a world we might have. Paul, he was writing from a Roman prison to the Philippians in chapter 3, and he was writing about the, his heritage and about the value of the law. And in Philippians 3, Paul is teaching uh, about how, uh, how uh, the, the, there's danger when we over-rely on the law in terms of our believers' righteousness. He understood that the law had been a gift that had been received by the people of Israel. And in today's scriptures, we also discover that the way, uh, there's a way that the law, it, when it's used in both our sacred and our secular lives, it can be equally either life-giving or destructive. And so the challenge is to allow the law its proper place and use it to lead us into a life that is flourishing, that, that provides for human flourishing in this world, uh, that it is a gift, it should be, then be that gift of life that is available to everyone. But when we do not use it that way, then it becomes destructive. Paul begins this chapter by warning against those who would try to turn believers from grace to law. Now, as the, he went about teaching the Gentiles, he was teaching the Gentiles about Christ, and there were those who had dogged the trails of the apostles and endeavored to compel the Gentiles to submit to circumcision and to the other uh, Jewish practices in order to be saved, and that was not what Paul was preaching. It, it was uh, justification by faith and faith alone. And so Paul lists his, his pre-Christian confidence in his own righteousness through the law in various ways. He tells us how confident he is about his own righteousness in the law. And yet, then he contrasts that with the confidence that he now finds because he lives in Christ alone. I, I retreat to the innermost citadel of my holy faith, namely to the very heart of Christ. When my spirit is assailed by temptation or deceived by sorrow, then I retreat to, to Christ. When I have high spiritual enjoyments, enjoyments rich and, and gracious and celestial, they are always with Jesus only. Paul's desire was to know Christ and to know Christ to the very depth of who he was. To know God and to be as close to God as though he could touch him. Martin Luther, the catalyst of the Protestant Reformation, he dealt with a lot of guilt in, in his life. He, he did a lot of self-flagellation, a lot of, he had a lot of guilt surrounding his faith because he didn't think he was doing quite enough to be as righteous as he wanted to be. And, and so he felt guilty about that until he finally uh, was able to find this theory of justification by faith. That we are justified by our faith in Jesus Christ. Well, then Wesley, he also struggled quite a, a bit with that same kind of thing, that same kind of guilt. Um, and, and at Aldersgate, he had that heartwarming moment where suddenly he realized what it was that he needed in order to be able to feel that, that, that he was where he needed to be. But that, that was never Paul's experience. That was never Paul's experience. In fact, Paul can honestly say and did say that as to the observance of the, the observance of the law, I was blameless. I was without fault in following the law of God. And, and he was he saw himself as without fault in his previous life. So he wasn't ashamed of his previous life. He he knew that he had followed the, the law as it was taught to him as a Pharisee. And he, he happily placed himself among those who were descendants of Abraham as a part, person who had born into the tribe of Benjamin. He didn't see his life as, bad, as a bad thing because it wasn't. But nonetheless, he wanted to leave it all behind. Paul didn't see that previous life as something to run away from. He saw his accomplishments under the law as a credit to his name. 
He had done good things. And, and, but what he meant when he said, whatever gains I have, he, he was talking about whatever gains he had under the law. And so he saw those as credit at one point, but he wanted nothing but Jesus as he's writing to the Philippians. And so anything he had gained at that point, he just he, he went over to the lost column. And, and so it is with us. When we, when we accept Jesus into our lives, you know, everything that we've accomplished in this life, and this worldly life, our worldly accomplishments, become nothing compared to our accomplishments through Christ, in Christ, as we live. He, we, he considered all of that uh, to be garbage, to be a loss. And the very thing that he'd seen previously as a credit now was a loss and, and less than no consequence because he had found something far better. It's not that what he had was bad or that the life that he led was bad. It's that Christ was far better than the life that he had previously. So he left behind what was good for something that was great. Now, that's not, not usually the case when we hear about a conversion, is it? When you hear a conversion story, how many of you have ever told your conversion story? Any of you? Well, if you ever, we hear conversion stories. When we hear the conversion stories, the usual story we hear is about somebody who's way down on their luck, right? They're way down on their luck. They're, they're messed up. Their lives been messed up. And suddenly Jesus comes into their life and suddenly their lives are, are able to get straight and they're able to, to be a, that better person, right? That's the usual that's the usual conversion story we hear. But that's not what Paul's life was. That's not Paul's conversion story. Paul's life was already straightened up. He was already a Pharisee. He was already an educated man. He knew about God. He knew the laws. Uh, he had a good life. He had a lot of things to his credit. And yet Paul was ready to lose every one of those things so that he could take up Christ. How many of us are ready to let go of everything else in our lives so that we can focus on Christ? The law was a good gift of God. Paul knew to the descendants of Abraham, to those in Israel, but Jesus Christ was an even better gift than all of that. Yeah, even a better gift because it wasn't just for the Jewish people, it wasn't just for Israel, but Jesus was for everybody. Jesus was for everybody. And if that's true for Paul and his life under the God-given Mosaic law, then how much more is it for us and all of the worldly ways that we try to distinguish ourselves. This passage reminds me, uh, reminds us that whatever credits we possess are nothing compared to what we have in Jesus Christ. Nothing. So it doesn't matter. Everything else, our foils, our foibles, our, our greatest gains, our greatest achievements are all dumb. They're all garbage compared to what we have in Christ. And so Paul left everything to get behind so that he could gain Christ. It reminds me of Jesus' parable of the merchant who sold everything to buy that pearl of great price. Jesus was that pearl for Paul, and Jesus should be that pearl for us as well. Paul had been willing to lose everything to gain Christ. As one commentator put it, to be rich in Christ means to be rich in Christ alone. And all of us can be rich in Christ because Christ is giving himself to us freely all the time. When we get stuck, uh, when we need comfort, when, because we're stuck in this uh, realization that our world is unfair, and you've ever noticed that our world is unfair? It is. When we get stuck in the injustice of someone else who treats people poorly and then seems to always come out ahead, regardless of how badly they treat everybody. Uh, and when we get stuck with that unfairness of someone who doesn't work near as hard as you do but ends up being wealthy and having everything in the world, when we get stuck on that or when we get stuck on how someone else uh, gets things that, that they never ask for, and they don't deserve, or at least we don't think they deserve, <laughs> the unfairness of it. When we think about that, 
we really don't need to be focused on all of that stuff. I imagine it, it, when I get in one of those rants, feeling a, a, sorry for myself because of the unfairness of life, that I can hear Christ saying to me, you know, I've given you myself. I've given you myself. Everything else in the world pales in comparison to me. What are you getting so hung up on all of this thing, all these things that just don't matter in the end? None of that will matter in the end. And how many times do we get stuck on the stuff that doesn't matter in the end? The righteousness we have is because of our faithfulness, uh, the, the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. That is where our righteousness comes from. That we, we receive that righteousness when we have faith in Christ. With the life and death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we're called into that relationship with Jesus, uh, into the relationship with God through Jesus, not through the law. We aren't, we're given a checklist that says, okay, follow this checklist of laws and make sure that you check all of those each and every day. That's not what we are called to. We are called to be in relationship with God through Jesus Christ in our lives, to build that relationship each and every day, to place our trust in, to set our hearts on, and to commit ourselves into God through Jesus. Paul also wasn't surprised that when he set his life in Jesus that he was persecuted. He wasn't surprised that there was going to be suffering in his life. In fact, Paul saw that suffering as a chance for him to grow closer to God, to, as a chance to identify with Christ's suffering in the world. But at the time, he doesn't forget the power of, of the resurrection. He doesn't forget what Jesus has done for all of us. So often in our faith, Christ followers, as Christ followers, we go off in one direction or another. We're, we're focused on the cross or we're focused on the resurrection. But the reality is, the truth is that what God did in Jesus Christ requires both. It's not just about the cross or the resurrection. It's about both the cross and the resurrection. The early Methodists had two things that they always tried to remember, and they're both very important. They're even important for us today as Methodists. And so one, number one, was not the pursuit presume upon God's grace. How many of you know people who presume upon God's grace? It's not to presume upon God's grace, and what that meant was don't assume that everything's going to be okay, and, and then not do your own part. Okay? Don't expect that God's going to do everything for you. Uh, don't presume on God's grace. Uh, you need to do your part as well. But at the same time, also believing that we should have some confidence in the salvation we have in our belief in Jesus Christ. They said we can have that confidence because we experience salvation here and now in our relationship with God in this life. And that relationship is just a foretaste of the salvation that is to come when we come face to face with God. We must hold those two together and to be confident in our salvation, yet not be presumptuous. Not be presumptuous of God's grace. Christ had grabbed a hold of Paul. Christ had seized Paul. And just as Christ had taken a hold of Paul, so in that same way, Paul wanted to take a hold of Christ and to hold on to Christ in, in a life that was built focused on Christ. He wanted to journey deeper and deeper into that relationship with God, with Christ, he wanted to go further, and he wanted the maturity and the completeness, the perfection that God promised him in Jesus Christ. No matter how far we press on, we too are on that same journey that Paul is on, was on. We, we have that spiritual mountain that we all are journeying upon, that we all are climbing. And when we press on, when we keep pressing on to climb that spiritual mountain, we do this through what we call the means of grace. And those are the works of piety, such as prayer and reading it and, and uh, hearing and explaining of the scripture. It's also through those works of mercy 
that, that we, those works of mercy that we use to care for others around us, provide for our neighbors, those acts of loving kindness that we show one another out in the world. And as we do those things, we need to remember the prize of the heavenly call of God, not only for this life, but for our life to come in the future. Ultimately, the only righteousness that has value for us is the righteousness that Paul talks about. And that's the righteousness that's given to us as a gift from Jesus Christ. That is the only righteousness that is worth, that has value. And, and which draws us into a life and joy of, in Christ's resurrection. Even leading us out to serve others and to love others with this cross, uh, cross embracing, self giving love for others. The temptation, however, for us is often we choose the law over the unpredictable, scary journey with intimacy with God. Like the Israelites. We may find dealing with God too difficult or too frightening. We don't want to deal with God. Sometimes we think of God as being this angry old man who's just out to get us. But that's not the case. But when we use the law in that way, we, we take our, we, we settle into rituals and we settle into traditions and we make them idols and we replace our God. Ultimately, the truth that we must face is whenever we choose the law over relationships, whether it's with God or with each other, when we do that, we lose life. And we become destructive. We become those who are not flourishing, but destroying. And then we become like vineyards that produce rotten fruit. All right, I'm not going to read all the questions to you. I'm going to focus on the very last one because this is your challenge for this week. I want you to take the rest of the questions and use them during your lunches together, during your time in the car, just to have a conversation. To pick some questions to do that. But today, focus on in what way you can renew your commitment to press on toward the goal of being like Christ this week. How can you be more like Christ this week? Can you do the press on? Would you